this. When you died, it didn't feel real. It felt like a movie. And this is the part where the character never recovers. The part where life takes them down. This is the scene that scars her forever. This is just the beginning. In the seventh episode, Lexi's definitely coming into her own. Through the play and her relationship with Fezco, she's sort of developing more of a voice. You know, what I love about Lexi and Fezco talking is just that there was something that felt kind of innocent and, and beautiful about that ability to sort of dig deeper into one another. It's genuinely endearing. I think when you see us talk, like, you realize that we aren't that different. I love Angus, I hope he loves me back. But we just, I think, love each other and like love working together, and so it, it feels very natural. I'm gonna be sitting in the front row, shorty. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you that. Okay. You really see Fezco's innocent side coming out. I feel like Fezco never, you know, dressed up like that to support someone he cares about. I mean, I go too far. I feel like there's definitely some a little more than a friendship, so she's bummed not to see him. Lexi, as a character, is someone who's often felt outside of the world. She's trying to figure out how to kind of emotionally make sense of the fact that she's never in the middle of something. She's always sort of witnessing something, and so she does that through putting on this play, which may or may not ruffle some feathers. The whole season, she's like, is Cassie going to think this is cruel? Like, I, I don't mean it to be, but I think Lexi kind of does. Like, maybe in her head, she's kind of like, you know what, like, Cassie kind of deserves it. I need you to pull it way back. You're too broad. It's not funny. Oh my god, are you crying? When I was in high school, I was a producer of our, like, senior sketch show. And I was awful, like a tyrant. <laughs> we were talking about that and how that could be funny for Lexi. Like, she doesn't care about making people angry. Like, she's got to do what she's got to do. Mick, Mick, you, you're a blind three-year-old could do a better job than you. I think the play is also just, like, a way for her to have any type of control and cope with things that happened in her life that are really hard. Deconstruction of memory or, or like an event is an important element, I think, of this year's uh, show and style. <laughs> How you show a memory, the fact that it's a play on stage, we can get away with exaggerated stylized moments. We are trying to rely on a certain kind of realism throughout. And when it's justified by emotions, then we depart from that realism. All this is grounded in the writing. With the feelings and emotions that it, that it conjures up for the characters themselves, you know, the play sort of allows the present and the past and the interpretation of life to play out simultaneously. It's pretty cool to see, like, <laughs> the same memories that we saw with Cassie and her character in season one, but how Lexi saw them. So we have some moments with our dad that Cassie remembers super fondly, and Lexi does not. I also kind of always think of this episode as not just Lexi's play, but the subjective experience of all the characters who are watching her play and what they see in it. Like, I'm never quite sure if this is exactly what Lexi's putting on or if it's their interpretation of it. Seeing my doppelganger was just wild. Like, doing season one looks. 
like her pony. I love her. She's so cute. The play was incredible. I have to say, like, watching it and giving my reactions have been very genuine. It was very funny. <laughs> I played it as if Cassie didn't quite know what was going on during the play, and then once she realizes Nate's getting more and more aggressively upset, she starts to put two and two together, and she's like, oh, shit, this is us. As Nate, it's like absolute embarrassment. I mean, even just for me, to have these people kind of just staring at you, just laughing and pointing at you, and then there's definitely a bunch of takes where I'm meant to be looking sad, and I was like... <laughs> It was a lot of fun, like, playing different characters that have already been on the show and having my big version of them. We've just been having so much fun, like, rehearsing these over-the-top sort of, like, sitcom -y scenes. Ugh, I look disgusting. It's kind of crazy to have an audience reacting to what you're doing, because we rarely get that. <laughs> we just felt like we were in a sitcom. Just make sure you're clicking that thing a hundred fucking times. <laughs> oh, hey, cut it! I love making them laugh, and like it was really cool to feel the uh, like emotional energy of being on stage and connecting with an audience. You ready? Yeah, I'm fucking ready. Yeah, you ready? Yeah, I'm fucking. Ready. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. Come on, let's post some iron, boys. <laughs> When I read Holding Out for a Hero, the dance number, I hadn't done, like, a, a play in a long time, you know, let alone dance in front of people. So, yeah, it was super terrifying, but also, like, really exciting. You know, Hero is so playful and absurd and raunchy. <laughs> like, a, any great story, it's like, what, where's the arc? What's the meaning? You know, in rehearsal, we try to make it like a scene where we, you know, direct the narrative and maybe this is your character, you're a mad scientist, and you're, like, conjuring up this big cock to come down, and, like, he's like, oh, yeah, I got that. <laughs> it was great. I mean, I, I really love Ryan Heffington, our choreographer. I, like, I really love that guy. That dance is super sexual, and, like, it's a lot of running around and physicality. Yeah, I mean, it's just fun. The music tells me a lot. You know, there's, like, this kind of drum, kind of machine gun. I was like, of course, he's going to jizz all over everyone during that part, because that's what it sounds like. <laughs> also, these awes, it's like so religious, it sounds like a chorus. And of course, that's when, you know, this punching bag penis comes down. Towards the end, the big shablam is, you know, this big cum shot of confetti. And <laughs> it told me what it wanted to be, I guess. It might make people feel uncomfortable a little bit, but I'm fine with that. I don't know if I've loved a piece this much in a long time. All the credit in the world goes to Ryan and Austin, who just really jumped into it with 100% of his soul. All I had to, to do in that situation was just film it and not miss a beat.